Hi there, my name is Steve and I'm coming to you live from the campus of Appalachian State. Today we're going to learn how to write the GED 2014 Social Studies Extended Response. Our watchword today is CALM. I know that you can write this extended response and you're going to come out of here today feeling like an expert and be able to show everyone you know how to do this. You may be thinking, you know, Steve, why should I waste my time writing this response? Well, the answer to that is, is it's 18 percent of your score on the social studies test. If we look here at all our dots here on the page, you know, 18 percent is going to be each row has 10 in it. We're going to be choosing this many of these 100 dots that are on the page. That's a good chunk of your score and so it's well worth the time that it's going to take to do this response. We're going to use the acronym ERPWE to help us today as we plan about how we're going to write our extended response. ERPWE has a couple things that it stands for. Starting with the U, the U says we're going to unpack the prompt. In other words, what is the prompt telling us to do? Then we're going to read through the passage, or in the case of social studies, passages, as we'll see in just a second. And then we're going to create a plan. How are we going to attack this response? The last two parts of ERPWE our uh, W, which stands for write, we're going to go ahead and write our response. And if we have some time left at the end, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to go through and edit it. The information you're asked to write about in social studies has two parts. And the first part is called the enduring issue. That's just really a fancy name for some things that we as Americans have been struggling over for a lot of our history. Okay, so you're asking, Steve, what exactly is an enduring issue? Well, an enduring issue is something that we've struggled with over time. What did free speech mean in Ben Franklin's day? What does it mean today? Does it mean that like this gentleman's doing over here, can we take our spray can and graffiti on the walls? A lot of these enduring issues are things like First Amendment rights, um, our freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. How has that changed over time? Another huge category of enduring issues is this one that we see here at the top of the page. The majority rules, but they must respect minority rights. So how might that look? We see here a picture of uh, school children back in the 1940s saluting the American flag. Well, one of the issues you might discuss is the famous Supreme Court decision in 1943 about West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. And in that case, there was some Jehovah's Witnesses who don't believe in saluting the flag. And the Supreme Court ruled that um, they could not be forced to salute the flag. So um, the majority rules of the majority of people in our country will salute the flag, but we do have to respect the rights of folks like Jehovah's Witnesses who do not feel that they can do that. So our three main tasks on the social studies response are first, we have to figure out what this enduring issue is saying, this thing that was written maybe 200 years ago. What exactly does it say? Then we've got to tie it into the a later speech or quotation that's given. And we have to see, is that really saying the same thing or is it something different? And then finally, we have to be able to provide some historical context. In other words, what was going on in history during that time? Or if we can provide some modern day example of that right, we'll be in good shape. This is not as hard as it sounds, and I'll provide you with some tips on how to do this. Anytime you're doing any type of writing on the GED test, you want to follow one big rule, and that is read the prompt first, read the prompt first, read the prompt first. Did he say read the prompt first? Yes, he did. Read the prompt first. That way you'll know exactly what it is they're asking you to do. Well, someone told me to read the prompt first, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So the prompt says... In your response, develop an argument about how Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s position in his speech reflects the enduring issue expressed in the quotation from the Declaration of Independence. Incorporate the relevant and specific evidence from the quotation, the speech, and your own knowledge of the enduring issue and the circumstances surrounding the civil rights movement to support your analysis. Type your response in the box. This task may require 25 minutes to complete. Notice how it's said in the prompt, look for evidence. We're going to tackle the reading and look for these things that um, Dr. King is going to be saying in the speech we're going to look at in just a minute. It's not based on our opinion, but it's based on the evidence from the source text. So now that we've read our prompt, we're going to dive into the source text. The source text will have that excerpt 
that enduring issue, and then it will have some type of a later reading that we'll tackle, and we'll try to see how we can tie the two in together. So let's read our excerpt, and it says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's from the Declaration of Independence from 1776. The second part of our source text is a speech, so let's check it out. In this excerpt from his August 28, 1963 speech during the March on Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. explains his views about how black Americans felt during the Civil Rights Movement. I want to pause here just a second because we can see that <clears throat> we've been given some valuable information already here about the historical context in this part right here. We know when the speech was written. We know what big historical event was going on during this time period. So already we've got some great information to help us with that historical context. Let's go ahead now and read the rest of the speech. It says, The Negro still is not free 100 years later. The life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corner of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was the promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. I still have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Okay, so now that we've read our prompt and read our passage, it's time to create a plan. So my father always used to tell me, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, and you can very easily paint yourself into a corner like this poor gentleman has done here. What we're going to do here is write four short paragraphs about how we're going to tie these two parts of our source text together. In our first paragraph, what we're going to do is explain the enduring issue. What was that quote from the Declaration talking about? And then we're going to tie it into what Dr. King was saying in his speech. We're going to show in our first body paragraph that King really agrees with what the Declaration was saying and the promises that were made. But, and this is going to be the subject of our next paragraph, he also points out that black Americans at this time during the 1960s could not use the rights that were promised because of discrimination and segregation. And then finally, it asks us to do some historical context, so we'll discuss the civil rights movement very, very briefly. So paragraph one, we're going to describe the enduring issue, and we're going to show how it ties into Dr. King's speech. What I like to do when we're looking at these uh, writings that were written so long ago is to try to piece them together and see what they're saying. Well, it's basically saying that we've got um, certain things that are self-evident, or in other words, everybody should know what these things are. And then he goes on to list them. He says all men are created equal, and they all have rights that are endowed by their Creator. Since that's capital C, he's probably talking about God here. So people have God-given rights, and then he goes on and lists those. And among these are we have a right to our life, we have the right to liberty, or in other words, freedom and the pursuit of happiness. And I like to think about that as you're able to go out and chase your dream, whatever that may be. So what we've done here is we've just basically taken this enduring issue, and I like to try to write this in a short phrase in modern language and using my own words. So what I've said here is that the Declaration says that everyone's created equal and has rights that can't be taken away to their life, to freedom, and to chase their dreams. So you might think about this as, can we take this old enduring issue and could we make a tweet out of it? Because something we could do in a short, short sentence and write it in modern day language so it makes sense to us. 
So what we're going to do here is uh, we're basically going to tie this together in our first paragraph. We've already unpacked what the enduring issue is. Now we're going to tie this into what Dr. King was saying in his speech. So we're looking to see how that enduring issue about all men are created equal and have certain rights um, ties together with what Dr. King sang. And he says here that when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and Declaration, they were signing a promissory note, and that's just a, a promise that you'll pay someone. And this promissory note was written to all Americans and basically said that all Americans would be guaranteed the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But he goes on to say that here in the 1960s, when he's making the speech in 1963, that uh, people of color are not being able to enjoy these rights, that um, instead of honoring this obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. The promise that was made is not being followed. So in this opening paragraph, what I've done then is I've just really unpacked what the enduring issue is and showed how it ties into Dr. King's speech. And so um, I'll just go ahead and write this. I can always edit it later. But it says the Declaration of Independence says that everyone's created equal and has rights that can't be taken away to life, to freedom, and to chase their dreams. In his 1963 speech, Dr. King agrees with the principles shown in the Declaration. He also says that black Americans were not being given their rights because of segregation and discrimination and would fight to get their rights. If you remember later on, he talked about that there's going to be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negroes granted his citizenship. And he's referring to the things that were going on during the Civil Rights Movement. In our second paragraph, what we're going to do is we're going to show how Dr. King agrees with the Declaration of Independence. And I've got another slappy acronym, P. No, not that kind of P. I'll explain to you exactly what that means. The P I'm talking about is this P. The P stands for point. We're going to make our point. In this case, our point is going to be that Dr. King agrees with what the Declaration was saying. But we're going to back it up with evidence. Our opinion doesn't matter. We need to pick out some quotes or make some paraphrases, say these things in our own words to show that this, this is what the text is saying, not us. And then finally, we're going to explain how this evidence supports our point. So that's the P that we're talking about. Make our point, back it up with evidence, and then explain how the evidence supports the point that we're making. So now I'm going to go back through the speech and see if I can pick out some evidence to show that Dr. King agrees with what's being said in the Declaration of Independence. And so I go on through, it gave us that um, introduction information up here, it says the Negro is still not free, um, still leaves a lonely island. So he's talking more here about what's happening now. So I'm going to go on to look at the other part of the speech to see where I can really pick out where he says he agrees with the Declaration. When he's talking about 100 years later here, right after the Civil War in the 1860s, slaves were freed by the 13th Amendment. So he's talking about 100 years later since he's speaking here in 1963. Okay, I've got my magnifying glass here. I'm still hunting for evidence. Let's see, I'm going down. Ah, here we go. When the architects wrote the magnificent words, they were signing a promissory note, and the note said basically the promises in the Declaration that black men as well as white men would be guaranteed the rights. So we've got some great evidence here. And then he's continuing to go on to say that they've defaulted, but we've got some great, great, great evidence up here that we're going to go ahead and use in our writing. So what I'm doing in this body paragraph is I'm showing how Dr. King agrees with what the Declaration is saying. And I'm going to use that P to do it. I'm going to make my point, I'm going to have some evidence, and then I'm going to explain how that evidence backs up my point. So starting out with the topic sentence here that in 1776... The um, Declaration said that all men are created equal and have basic rights. Okay, we've got that. Um, and then show the tie-in. Dr. King agrees and compares the Declaration to a promise to be paid. What I've done here now is go to the text, and I've brought in some evidence. I'm going to use a direct quote from the speech. The promise was that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life. Oops, got a typo here, but we'll, we can edit this at the end, so we'll go back and fix it. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness. While the Declaration promised rights to everyone, black Americans were not allowed to use these rights. So almost 200 years after the Declaration, black Americans did not have equal rights, and for them, the promise to pay was instead a bounced check. 
So I'm just taking evidence here from the passage and using it to back up what I'm saying. So now as we dive into our third paragraph, what I'm going to try to do here is just show that Dr. King really said, yes, but. Yes, he agrees with those principles outlined in the Declaration, but black Americans at this time were not able to use these rights because what was going on in the country at that time. This was not a proud chapter in our history. During the 1960s in the American South, we did see things like this sign up here that was separating the races. We had a, a white drinking fountain and a colored drinking fountain. Um, and in order to um, work against this, we did see a lot of protests beginning in the um, late 50s and continuing into the 60s where people were demanding things like you can see here, decent housing, decent pay, um, jobs for everyone, and just essentially justice, wanting to be treated equal just as what was outlined in the Declaration of Independence. So here in our third body paragraph, what I'm going to do again is use that P acronym, make my point, bring in some evidence from the text, and then explain how it fits in. So the topic sentence that I used is here in his speech, Dr. King shows that black Americans are not free, even though slavery had ended 100 years before. And he mentioned that 100 years during that very first part of the excerpt from the speech we had. He talks about how blacks are segregated and discriminated against. And uh, in the South, black Americans had to use separate water fountains and could not be served in many restaurants. Um, Dr. King also shows that black Americans cannot pursue their dreams. Because of discrimination, they live in poverty while the rest of the U.S. prospers. And this is just a paraphrase from exactly from what Dr. King was saying. So I brought in some evidence from the speech and explained a little bit more about what it was talking about. So in this last paragraph, I'm really going to try to work on this historical context, or in other words, explain what's going on here in the 60s, and uh, showing in particular how the Civil Rights Movement was trying to work to help black Americans gain their rights. On the social studies test, when trying to pick out this historical context, our BFF, our best friend, is always this little blurb that's going to occur right before they dive into the speech. And that's going to help us out so much with knowing what's going on. We know when the speech was given. We know the big historical event that was going on, the Civil Rights Movement. So it helps to have some background knowledge, but you can use a lot of the information given here to really help you in a couple sentences about the time period. So we know the Civil Rights Movement is going on. There's something else in Dr. King's speech that will really help us to see something else that we can use for historical context. He says there's going to be neither rest nor tranquility until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. So if we can put this into simpler words, he's basically saying black Americans are going to protest, black Americans are going to fight, black Americans are going to revolt until they are granted their equal rights that are outlined in the Declaration. So in this last paragraph, I'm going to use that helpful blurb of information they gave us, as well as some information from the passage, and a little bit of background information that I have. For example, that background information, I know that the Civil Rights Movement helped lead to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, some laws for fair housing, and the rights for things like to be served in a restaurant. So I want to include that part as well. So, of course, I'm going to use my P acronym, Make My Point, put in that evidence, and then explain how that backs it up. So here goes for the last paragraph. During the 1960s, Dr. King and others worked to help black Americans gain equal rights during the Civil Rights Movement. They gave speeches, they held protests, and they demanded equal rights. The Civil Rights Movement helped black Americans get basic rights like the right to vote and to not be discriminated against in housing and be served in a restaurant. Dr. King also said the U.S. would not rest until black Americans were treated fairly. So what we've seen was a little bit today about how to unpack that response. As you're taking the actual test, you will put your information in a box that'll look something like this. And just know that this box will expand. It just works like a Microsoft Word document, so you can write more than what's in this dinky space. But if you follow those steps, go through, read that prompt first, unpack it, see what it says, tied into the later response. And we don't have to do four paragraphs. Sometimes we could do two, sometimes we could do three. But if we really do those things, plus be able to provide some historical context from that clues they give us, we're gonna be in great shape for this writing. 
And of course, our last step in ERPWI is to edit. So spend a few minutes, go back through, make sure your sentences make sense, make sure your paragraphs are looking good, make sure you're always keeping that formal tone that you would do for academic writing and not the slang or text type talk that we might use. So um, you do have 25 minutes in which to write it. Doesn't seem like a lot of times, but GD Testing Service is actually finding that people aren't using that whole time. So um, you could probably go through and do the reading and uh, planning and probably about 10 to 15 minutes, write in about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll leave you a minute or two at the end to edit. If you want some more information on some tools, we've got a graphic organizer and writing frame and some other things. If you'll Google A, B, as in Bob, S, P, D, Google that, um, Adult Basic Skills Professional Development. We've got some other great resources to help on the social studies test. So until we see each other again, this is Steve signing off. Have a great day.